As some of you may know, I've created a series of videos outlining how I would make a DC universe. Originally, it didn't start that way. It started off with pitching a Superman trilogy, then a Green Lantern saga, a Flash movie, and then a Justice League one too. However, questions still have laid unresolved, movies still to be made, so I'm taking you through how I would pitch a phase two in this universe, the movies that would follow up phase one, whilst attempting to expand the universe in new and enticing ways. So with that being said, let's take a look at phase two of the Super Frame DC Universe. Before I dive into the epicness of the Justice League, I want to thank the sponsor of this video. Now this video is sponsored by the one, the only, Raid Shadow Legends. Whatever it is you're doing, there is no way it can be as awesome, as exciting, and as fun to play as Raid. If you've got a phone, a can-do attitude, and a want to dive into the world's best mobile game, this is your chance by diving into the world of Teleria. Raid Shadow Legends, as many of you know, is a free-to-play turn-based MMO, a game with an incredibly strong emphasis on combining your heroes in unique ways to vanquish all manner of threats. However, as a story guy myself, what I enjoyed most about Raid was the world building. My three favourite game modes were the campaign, dungeon and arena game modes. The campaign because it brought out the lore I love in games like this, the dungeons because it allowed me to grind away, and the arena because it forced me to play smarter against my opponents. Raid has built out an expansive world that's extremely easy to jump into, a combination of PvE and PvP game modes, and untold levels of champions to choose from. In the Bastion, your base of operations, you'll find a place to customise and upgrade your champions. With over 650 different champions to choose from, you'll never be short of the literal billion different ways you can customise them. Speaking of champions, there's a ton of new holiday champions this season to choose from. Even the Bastion's been decorated to look all wintry. Isn't that nice? This month, Raid has a huge new update with a ton of new features including a brand new dungeon and the introduction to Artifact Ascension. Also, if you're an Amazon Prime member, you can get your exclusive rewards in Raid right now. Get this though, I think the wildest thing Raid has going for it right now is introducing Ronda Rousey to the game. All you have to do is play Raid for 7 days between now and February the 20th and she's all yours. That's it. In addition to that, if you want a bunch of helpful stuff like a 3 day 100% XP boost, 500k silver and 5 full energy lifts, you can also use the promo code RAIDRONDA to help you out. Now if you haven't started playing Raid yet, click my link in the description or scan my QR code here on the screen and you'll get a unique bonus up to $30. Bonuses like a free champion, 200k silver, 1 energy refill, 1 XP boost and much more as soon as you get into the game. Seriously this is a deal not to be missed, now have fun playing Raid. First off, I just want to start off by saying, get fucked if you think I'm pitching an entire Justice League movie again. That shit took three months to hand draw, that's way too much effort. On top of that, even now do I look back at something solid I've made and have started to find holes, little ways I think it could be better. Even you guys have done the same. One comment expressed how it'd be neat if Batman understood related to Superman saying he can't lose anyone else, and that's why Batman decides to trust him. Another comment stated that Hawkman should have been a part of Wonder Woman 1 as a part of the Justice Society, whilst Wonder Woman saw something in humanity worth saving, Hawkman saw the opposite a reason to leave humanity to their own devices. He saw the brutality of war and left Earth for Thanagar, forsaking a doomed planet. In a way, giving him just that much more character going into the Justice League movie. Look, these are all great ideas, but there is no way in hell I'm doing the same for Justice League 2. I can't do something that in depth again. Maybe if it's the right project, you can twist my arm. <coughs> X-Men. However, it just takes way too long. The first video almost killed my channel. Taking three months for one video? Nah. No sir. Not, not happening. No, not again. So, today I'll be going over a loose-ish outline of what I'd want from these movies, the succession they would appear in, and what Phase 2 is working towards, not just culminating in a second Justice League movie, but also what the larger vision is of these movies, and what we're working towards. So, to recap for those not caught up, Phase 1 of my DC Universe consisted of The Batman, Superman Man of Tomorrow, Green Lantern, Batman, Heart of Night, The Flash, Wonder Woman, HBO's Green Lantern Corps, Green Lantern Sinestro Corps War, Superman Brainiac, and then finally, the Justice League movie. Leading up to Justice League, Batman has learned that he needs to become more than vengeance. 
to be a hero. He's also taken on more theatrical adversaries that are less realistic whilst taking on a protege, learning to trust others with his secret. As for Superman, he's established himself as the Captain America of this universe, a virtuous hero with good values. But after an increasingly large threat from Brainiac, he realizes he can't do everything alone and that culminates with his father's heart attack solidifying the idea in his mind that he wasn't powerful enough. One, to do the things on his own, and two, to save his father. Green Lantern will act as the Thor of this universe, expand the cosmos, and show us new races, potentially ones we might see in other movies. The first movie being about the Manhunters, it'll show us their atrocities. Keep that in the back of your head, it'll be relevant later. Its follow-up movie, Sinestro Core War, will expand on the hubris of the Jedi Council. Sorry, the Guardians. Just show us Sinestro's disdain for their arrogance. The movie really just writes itself. It's Revenge of the Sith, but with rings instead of lightsabers. It should be grand and operatic, and show us Anakin. Sorry, Sinestro's fall to darkness. I see through the lies of the Jedi. I do not fear the dark side as you do. I have brought peace, freedom, justice, and security to my new empire. Your new empire? Anyways, the HBO Max show will be a Rogue One S series that will run parallel with the movie, showing us the gritty and grimier sides of the galaxy, whilst introducing us to Jon Stewart. As for The Flash, he'll go through a personal tale that moves him past his pain and makes him learn a poignant lesson to slow down, to get a life. In the movie, we'll see a photo of his godfather, Jay, with the Justice Society back in World War II. This nod will get followed up in the Wonder Woman movie. Much like the actual Wonder Woman movie, it will see Diana stop Ares all the same, but with the help of the Justice Society, teaching Wonder Woman how to operate in a group setting, to lead. Red Tornado, just after figuring out what it meant to be human, dies. His pieces are assembled and put away in storage. Don't worry, he'll come back. <laughs> Justice League 3. Dr. Fate might remove the helmet only to never put it on again, and Hawkman might forsake humanity, leaving Earth until his return in Justice League. As for Jay, he just might retire. We see how the war has affected all these heroes. Some died, some retired, some grew to hate humanity, and some decided to save it. So, from here on out, it's pretty straightforward. We then jump into the events of my Justice League movie. If you haven't seen it yet, go click in the link in the description below, go to this timestamp, and then come back for the follow-up. So, coming out of that movie, Lex is a wise edge away from his illegal shit being known. He's using DNA experiments to thwart the rise in metas. And whilst that failed with the meta kids being saved, he still has an ace up his sleeve. Project BZ0, aka Bizarro. As for The Flash, he's been able to use what he learned in his first movie to remain the most emotionally balanced member of the Justice League. He's been able to call Superman on his shit and gotten him to question his endearing but reckless actions. Batman has gone from facing the mob and some guy who likes riddles to an intergalactic threat. He now holds reason to assemble help. Wonder Woman has shown her leadership qualities as well as highlighting her greatest asset, her compassion. She and John have been able to show Shiro the beauty in humanity, forging a powerful ally that helps defeat the main adversary of the movie, Hawkman, now the leader of the Thanagarians, the Emperor. One comment that made a lot of sense in the first video was why would Hawkman, the king, essentially send his wife, the queen, as a scout to a planet? I think a nice little retcon would be to have them betrothed but not married. Anyways, that's essentially where we've left the characters coming out of this movie. Superman is questioning himself, Hal, as mentioned, is off fighting an intergalactic war, John and Shiera are closer than ever, Barry is just, well, he's just a lovable guy, isn't he? Batman and Martian Manhunter are founding the Justice League, Batman funding it, and John doing the heavy lifting, and Wonder Woman, well, we'll get to her. I want to do something exciting with her next. Also, one thing I'd have is a post credit scene after Superman 2. Kara is visited by Brainiac 5 and is swept into the future. That's why we don't see her in the Justice League movie and why we won't see her in Phase 2. However, she is instrumental to Phase 3, so do not forget about her. So, no wasting time, we're just going to get straight into things. Green Lantern Rage of the Red Lanterns will begin Phase 2. It'll show us what Hal is up to during the events of Justice League and will run parallel with that movie, facing Atrocitus. It'll see the Red Lanterns destroy Oa in the finale of this trilogy. Ganther and Sade, two guardians who already left the core before its destruction, will found the Blue Lantern Core of Hope, an antidote to rage. This movie will be a narrative inversion of the first. We see what the Manhunters created when they destroyed Sector 666. We see Abensur's prophecy of Oa falling coming to pass, a prophecy he heard from the mouth of Atrocitus himself. 
Two movies later, it will be ironic that Atrocitus is the one to lay down the gauntlet on Oa. Coming out of this movie, the Blue Lantern Saint Walker has aided Green Lantern Hal Jordan and newcomer Guy Gardner in defeating Atrocitus, the movie ending with the Guardians deciding to rebuild Oa, but without their sense of hubris and entitlement which blinded them from such a prophecy from coming to pass, a prophecy they didn't want to believe. Back on Earth, we immediately follow up with Superman. Capping off his trilogy, this will continue the plot thread set up in Justice League, bringing closure to the ideas of needing to be there, needing to save everyone. It will be the big climax to his rivalry with Lex over three movies. There'll be a sense of finality to this conflict, that both characters have made their points known. Lex, the cynic, and Superman, the optimist. Perhaps Lex unleashes Bizarro and Superman. Lois throughout the movie uncovers Luthor was responsible for the creature outing Luthor to the public, with Lex outed as an outright villain, ruining his presidential campaign and facade as a stand-up businessman. He dons his battle suit in one last battle with Superman. Very Matrix revolutions in scope. Now, as much as they're punching at each other, they're also talking about concepts and ideas that punctuate either character's worldview. Very all-star Superman, almost. The movie ending with Lex in prison, Superman revealing his identity to Lois, and the two flying off happily ever after. Now before we get to Batman, we need to follow up with Robin in the HBO Max series Nightwing. Not included in the events of Justice League and pushed to the sidelines more and more as Bruce faces increasingly theatrical adversaries like Poison Ivy and that, Dick Grayson decides to leave Batman's side and take up the mantle of Nightwing. We see him experience what it's like to be a hero without Batman's support questioning his place in his world as he's quickly replaced by a new protege, Jason Todd. Dick faces off against the criminal underworld of Bloodhaven, teaming up with Zoe Kravitz's Catwoman. Now that's the external stuff. Internally, Dick's facing his value as a person, coming to terms with leaving Bruce's side and ultimately choosing a more positive life, a life not devoured by the mission, Bruce's mission, to have Dick live his own life the hero becoming the charismatic charmer by the series end. Now, Superman isn't the only one who gets to cap off this trilogy. Batman does too, with The Man Who Laughs. Now the poster I showed my patrons was this. Two-Face, right? But Superframe, you say? We've already seen Two-Face and the Joker in the Dark Knight. Won't this just be a retread of something we've already seen? And yes, you're completely right. That's why we're doing Red Hood, baby. This poster, fake, boom, get it out of here, trash. Red Hood, yes. I just did a Serpent Society on you. How's that feel? Now, this is the perfect time to adapt the Red Hood story. The Joker, Ray Jagul, Nightwing, Jason, all these pieces are in the right spot on the chessboard. Even the Penguin can fill the Black Mask spot. Now is the time to pull the trigger to tell this amazing story and cap off this trilogy with one of Bruce's most gut-wrenching stories yet. If there's ever a time to adapt this story, now would be a great time to do it. For those unfamiliar with the story, it begins with Jason's murder at the hands of the Joker. The Joker that was set up in Batman 1. From there, we go through Batman, the Joker, and Jason's past. Show how Jason and Bruce met, show how the Joker became disfigured, all whilst ghosts start to come a-knocking. It's a fantastic story and would serve as the perfect full stop to a Batman trilogy, leaving Bruce in a state of emotional anguish. So, that's all great, but this phase is starting to get a little monotonous. It's just sequels and spin-offs. What about something fresh, something that will make audiences go, wow, like really, wow. Not just in terms of scale, but substance. Well, I present to you the New Gods. Telling the tale of Orion on the planet New Genesis, we get to have fun by creating a limited series that is mythic, but at the same time, thought-provoking. We have characters whose lives span eons and thus have a captivating worldview. It's the Eternals done right. We have heroes born from pain, tragedy, and torture. Those with fates and destinies that are more of a burden than something aspirational. We get to tell a story of triumph and sacrifice, something that spans hundreds of years. It should be like a Dune type of scale. Houses and allegiances and prophecies and destiny, all that good stuff. Jumping back to reality, we're continuing with Central City's favourite hero, The Flash. Now a great question is, with Barry internally resolving two of the biggest issues in his first movie, where does that leave the character to go? If he's resolved things with his mum and learnt to slow down, what more can we teach him? What more can he go through? And, well, I think the answer lies within the question. Maybe there isn't any more to teach him. Maybe it's time for him to become a teacher, to be the fun uncle, the guy with the dad jokes. I'll be back in a flash. <laughs> back in a flash, wow. Does he say that often? <sighs> Too, Too often. often. Maybe it's time we introduce Wally West. Now, Wally is a fan favorite. To a lot of people, Wally is the Flash. And I think it's important that this movie focuses on Barry and Wally's brotherhood. 
Naturally, Grodd will be the villain. Maybe Barry and Iris get married by the end, all that fun stuff. This movie should be way more jovial than the first, without sacrificing the sincerity or stakes for our heroes. Perhaps Wally struggles with his powers. Part of his arc is learning that there's more power residing within him than Barry himself, that he's a gun that's going to fire. He just needs to learn where to aim it. Now, I love Justice League Unlimited. Like, seriously, what a show. So many fantastic characters, stories, and ideas that are explored. One of my favorites being Green Arrow. He's sarcastic and witty, but also manages to humanize a league of gods in a way Batman just could never. Still don't think I belong up here. That's the point. Someone like you will keep us honest. This is the utility a character like Green Arrow provides the Justice League, and that's why he needs his fair shake. Whilst the specifics of the show I'm not too concerned on, perhaps Black Canary gets introduced as well, and maybe the villain is Count Vertigo, what I'm more interested in is the themes and tone. I for one never liked Arrow, not even the first season. The show was so desperately trying to be Batman on a budget. Like Ra's al Ghul, come on man. Regardless, an entire generation of people think Green Arrow is some brooding vigilante, a Batman knockoff. What I want to see from this show is a return to form for the character. Not a goofball, but one reminiscent of the animated series. Or even one with heart and weight, like in Young Justice. You've been missing three months. I've been going crazy, so when I found you, him, I didn't question the good fortune. Okay, so, Wonder Woman. Now, I've stayed pretty quiet on Wonder Woman so far. With Diana, I want to do something fun. But not fun in the haha -ha way, fun in the oh shit way. With Wonder Woman 2, I want her to return to Themyscira. The status quo is set. Everything is normal as it comes. Being an ambassador, she might return with some scientists, bridging the gap between humanity and Themyscira. The trip is fairly normal, but one of them, a curious female scientist, strays from the path. She falls somewhere deep in the jungle and uncovers a prison on Themyscira holding a spirit. The spirit of... I'm not even going to try to pronounce that. You know, typical movie shit ensues. She touches some shit, is infected with the avatar of the god, and now we have Cheetah. Cheetah is on a mission to go down the pits of hell to release Hades, and thus Wonder Woman must stop her. Hippolyta states with great warning. The gates, however, to Hades must be closed, that they can't risk him escaping. Maybe Hippolyta warns against chasing Cheetah into the inferno, but Diana's heart shines through, that even a single soul is worth saving. So, what we essentially have is a movie of increasing isolation, something tense. Wonder Woman is alone, going into the Inferno, if anything being a metaphor for Dante's Inferno. All the skills she's used to succeed has been inverted, turned against her. She has to rely on her warrior instincts, not her compassion. She has to rely on herself and only herself, no teamwork to be found. What we get is a tense movie that culminates in her going down the Inferno, so to speak. The most danger we've ever seen her in, with no one to help facing monsters from Greek mythology, Cheetah, and finally, Hades himself. It should be a movie where things just get worse and worse for the character, that we see her increasing resolve, and her strength of mind as she tries to save the soul of the scientist from the Cheetah avatar and prevent Hades from escaping. I think a nice third act twist is Minerva, the scientist, liking the power of the Cheetah so much that she's fused with the Cheetah avatar. To Wonder Woman, this would just be heartbreaking, a spiritual failure, her faith in humanity questioned coming out of the movie as the good-hearted person succumbs to such power. Not corrupted, but voluntarily becoming evil. Now, this leaves us with the tail end of the phase, the second Justice League movie. Based off the poster, you can tell where this is heading. It's Tower of Babel, big boy. What a story this is. Now, for those not caught up with Tower of Babel or its animated movie, Justice League Doom, it sees Batman's contingency plans stolen by the bad guys. They're then used on the League in a myriad of ways, and it's up to the League to catch on before they're picked off one by one. I think, if reworked properly, this could serve as a great plot for our movie. It sees the Justice League face equal opponents. It separates them, only highlighting the importance of working together. And it thrusts our villains into the spotlight. Luthor going from presidential candidate who snapped and tried to kill Superman to outright supervillain now, using his genius and resources to orchestrate attacks on League members and founding the Legion of Doom, an underwater base. Yes, I said underwater, and this. This will be our way of introducing Aquaman and have him matter to the story. Batman doesn't have a contingency plan for him. Nobody knows he exists at this point. Perhaps when the Martian Manhunter continues to burn in the ocean, he finds him and nurses him back to health through Atlantean medicine. From here, the two go about fixing each leaguer's predicament. A bomb, 
Poison, so forth, until the League is reunited, facing off against the Legion in their base, a base Aquaman can locate due to being underwater. Leading the charge, the day is one and our heroes are A-OK. -okay. Now you could make this way denser, way more interesting, but this is just a loose outline. My plans for a second Justice League movie aren't that insane. It's not a groundbreaking kind of movie. If anything, it's just a way of introducing one character and highlighting how vital he is to our team succeeding or not. Aquaman essentially saving the League makes him an asset. An asset that sways the tide, eh, eh, of the battle. Man, someone shoot me, this is a dad joke, Jesus Christ. Anyway, the second Justice League movie will springboard a new status quo for our heroes going into Phase 3. As for what we're doing with Phase 3, how we're concluding this thing, well, you'll just have to come back for Part 3. At the end of the day, the point of the Justice League, the story of DC Comics, is a tale of humanity. It always has been. The point of Phase 2 is to reinforce those ideas. We see characters deconstructing this idea. Wonder Woman questioning her belief in humanity as a good-hearted person falls into the abyss. Green Arrow continuously grounding a group of gods that are starting to lose touch with the common man. Superman reaffirming his stance on truth and justice and standing up to bullies. Batman coming to grips with the lines people cross, how they can so quickly lose their humanity in just one bad day. Phase 2 questions and deconstructs our theme of humanity. So all that's left to do for Phase 3 is to reaffirm it. Now initially I wanted this video to come out on the 10th due to issues with file corruption, I had to push it back a couple days and I just want to thank everyone for being so patient, especially my patrons. You guys are the reason I get to make as content as regular as I am now. Specifically my Illuminati patrons, that being Kurt, Holland, James, William, Rex, Carson, Lance, Kai, Lidge, K Raven, Draco, Z, Screenspark, Young Stepper and David. You guys really keep this channel going and I just want to say thanks. Speaking of my Illuminati patrons, you guys can go onto my Patreon now and see all the character models and posters I use for this video, and you'll get early access to my review of Avatar The Way of Water, which I am seeing tonight. With that being said, I hope you guys have a lovely day, and I will see you guys in the next video. Ciao.